When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I want to welcome you to Brian Bible Church this morning. We're going to be talking today about ramifications of the resurrection. As we work our way through this fourth gospel, we see that Lazarus has presented us with the story of a number of phenomenal signs that Yeshua performed. And he tells us that his goal is that these signs should bring us to the confession that Yeshua is the Christ, the Son of God. We see this in basically in John 20 here, 30 and 31. This is the theme, this is the purpose of this book. He says, now Yeshua did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. So what we have in the book is not all of it. There's a lot of other things he did. He says, what you're not written in this book. There just wasn't room for everything. But these are written, and he, he picks out seven of them. These are written so that you may believe Yeshua is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So there were other signs that he did, but these, these what? These signs, okay? These signs, the, six, the seven that he lays out in this book, are written so that you may believe. Now, you've got to hang on to that, all right? He's writing about these miraculous signs so that we would believe. Now, in working our way through the first ten chapters of this gospel, we've seen six of these signs. Turning the water into wine. Healing the official's sick son. Restoring the lame man to health, feeding the 20,000, walking on the water, giving the blind man sight. And what's the point of these signs? Why is he doing these? Well, he tells us in chapter 10, verse 25, Yeshua answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. The signs that Yeshua performed gave evidence of who he was. He makes the claim to be the Messiah. He makes the claim to be God, and then he backs it up with a public display of supernatural power. He claims to be God, and he supports that claim with public miracles. So the miracles that are described in the fourth gospel are authenticating signs of his deity, of his Messiahship. Now as we come to chapter 11, he gives us the seventh and the final sign. And this whole chapter is about the miracle of the Lord raising Lazarus from the dead and the results of that. The raising of Lazarus is the climax of the Lord's public ministry. This is kind of it for His public ministry. What we have to understand here, the res- we looked last week at the actual resurrection of Lazarus. The physical resurrection of Lazarus is a picture of of our spiritual resurrection. This miracle is to confirm the statement of Yeshua in verse 25, where He said, I am the resurrection and the life. This miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead authenticated Yeshua's authority to grant eternal life to those who believe in Him. The resurrection of Lazarus is an acted out parable of the Christian conversion. It's a picture of what God does spiritually every time He saves a sinner. Our salvation is no less a miracle than the raising of a dead body. It requires the same power that Yeshua used when He raised Lazarus from the dead. We closed with these verses last time. When He had said these things, He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and his feet bound linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Yeshua said to him, unbind him and let him go. So standing at the tomb where they had rolled away the stone, now he's standing there and Lazarus has been dead for four days and there's a smell coming out of this tomb and he just cries out, Lazarus, come out. And he does. And he says to the witnesses, unbind him and let him go. This is a remarkable miracle done at a very strategic time just prior to Passover. Done in the place called Bethany, which is two miles east of Jerusalem, on the road from Jericho that is literally filled with pilgrims at this time, heading to Passover. 
So everybody coming that way would have heard this story of Lazarus. Now, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, any of that stuff, but let me tell you, this word spread fast. Anyone who knew, they were telling somebody else. This is not something that happens every day. Those who are witnesses, those who are there are just, can you imagine? You know, when you hear something exciting, you want to tell somebody else. Hey, look what I heard. This is something everybody's telling everybody else. You know that guy Yeshua, the rabbi Yeshua? Guess what? This guy was dead four days, he healed him. As more and more pilgrims begin to arrive in Jerusalem afar, they're hearing the story of what had happened to Lazarus. Now, as these verses, as you come to verse 43, and it just, okay, I'm buying them and let them go, and that's, that's the end of it. Wouldn't you like a little more information here? I mean, Lazarus comes out of the tomb, and then the scene changes, and we're at a meeting with the Sanhedrin. I mean, we don't know anything more about what happened at the resurrection. We don't know about the shock and awe that must have taken place with those that are standing by. We don't know about the conversations that took place. Can you imagine the questions that people are bombarding Lazarus with? What was it like? Where were you? What did you see? What, you know, when's the first time you realized you were alive again? How'd you get out of that tomb? I mean, all these questions that people wanted to know, none of that's discussed here. It's just, unbind him and let him go. And then we jump to verse 45, and it says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. So many of the Jews, they're there mourning. They were part of the procession when they took him to the tomb. They'd been around mourning for days. They know he's been dead four days. They see this, and it says they believed in him. Now you may be thinking, <laughs> of course they did. I mean, you see a man raised from the dead, wouldn't you believe? Well, Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, the man's in Hades and he argued, Lord, if you just if someone went from the dead, they'll repent. You'd think, wouldn't you? Someone comes out of the dead, I mean, that's a pretty good miracle. Yeah, let me pay attention to this. Well, the next verse says, he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. They're not, that, that's a miracle that's not going to really affect them. So many of the Jews who were there mourning Lazarus, they believed. But these are not convinced, even though they see someone rise from the dead. As we'll see in the next verse, some of the Jews are not convinced after seeing Lazarus rise from the dead. But here we are told that many of the Jews believed in him. That's awesome, right? What's this say about their spiritual condition? They believed in him, right? They believed in him. They're Christians. They believed. That's what it says. Right? Remember we read what the purpose of this Gospel was? These signs are written that you may believe. They see the sign. They believe! I mean, that seems simple to me, but you know there are some that conclude that these believers are not real believers. I know I pick on them a lot, but my buddy John MacArthur, <laughs> commenting on this verse, John writes this, there's a kind of believing that doesn't save. What? Really? So how do I know if I believe the right kind of belief? Where in this chapter, in this context, would you get the idea that these people weren't real believers? How would you get that? They saw the sign, they saw a dead man come to life, and they believed, and he goes, there's a kind that doesn't really say it. Well then, how do you know I got the right kind? And he's not alone in this. D.A. Carson writes this. They put their faith in Him. The caliber of their faith is not discussed. Do we need to discuss the caliber of their faith? See, the Bible says, the Word of God says, they believed in Him. That's good enough for me. That's the purpose of this Gospel. That's what it's about. If Lazarus records these selected signs to bring people to faith, how do we question the faith of those who believe because of the sign? I don't get it. But so many commentators, so many scholars say, 
well, these people believe just because of the signs. That's the purpose of the book. That's why he did these signs, to demonstrate who he was. Lazarus tells us these people believed in his name. And I believe that's what he meant. They became Christians. They received eternal life. Verse 25 tells us, Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. They believed and they were given the right to become the children of God. Their sins were forgiven. They were redeemed. Period. And those who question their faith, I think, have an agenda. Because there's no reason in this text whatsoever to question what the text says. All right, then we go on to the next verse. So we got many Jews believed, and it says, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Yeshua had done. So many believed and others were tattletales. I mean, verse 45 says, many of the Jews believed in Him. Verse 46 says, some of them told. All right, so some believed and some tattled. It would seem that these tattlers are not believers, because that's the comparison here. He's comparing believers the many, with the unbelievers, the some. So let me ask you this. Why do some believe? Some of those standing there saw this miracle and they believed. Some of those standing there didn't believe and ran to the Pharisees to tell them. What separates the believers from the unbelievers? Is it intelligence? Are some of them smart enough to figure it out and others aren't? In other words, some of them said, well, this guy was dead. He was rotting. Now he's alive. I think, there's, I think that means that this man is the Son of God. And I think, yeah, this is what it means. And others are saying, nah, it's some kind of trick. or whatever. They're, just not, they're not smart enough to figure it out. Is that what it's about? That's how people talk today. Like someone was smarter than somebody else because they figured it out and the other person didn't. So why didn't the resurrection of Lazarus, who had been dead four days, cause all the Jews to believe? Why didn't they believe? Okay, thank you, because chapter 10 says, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. That's why they didn't believe. They're not his sheep. Sheep follow the shepherd. And the Jews refuse to follow Yeshua because they're not His sheep. Look at verse 4. When He had brought out all His own, you see who He brought out? His own. He goes before them, and the sheep follow Him, for they know His voice. It's His own sheep, and they follow Him because they know that voice. The Jews don't follow Yeshua because they don't know His voice because they don't belong to Him. The ultimate reason they did not believe in Yeshua was that they were not His sheep. You don't believe because you have a lack of intelligence. Your will is getting in the way. You're a stubborn person and you won't, just, you won't trust me. None of that said. You don't believe because you don't belong to me. He is telling them they had not been called. They had not been given by the Father. They did not belong to His flock. Their unbelief was no surprise. And the reality is this, you can't come to God unless God calls you. 6.44, Yeshua says this, no one can come to me. It doesn't say very few people. It doesn't say a limited amount. It says no one can come unless, so there's a qualifying here, unless what? Unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's the only way Someone's going to come. And we've gone over this, but the word draw there is helkuo. And helkuo means to draw with irresistible superiority. Nobody comes unless my father draws them to me. And what's he going to do? I'll raise them up on the last day because they're mine. Yeshua is emphasizing man's inability to believe apart from the sovereign call of God. We've been seeing this all through this book. Strong emphasis on this in this whole book. Chapter 6, chapter 5, I mean 10. It's just loaded with this stuff. It says in verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees. 
These are not believers, so they, you know, they see the miracle, they just run to the Pharisees and they tell them. Now, the Pharisees were very powerful. They dominated the people with their laws and their rules about the Sabbath and their restrictions. The people pretty much knuckled under the power of the Pharisees. They were afraid not to. All right? It says, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? Now, the Greek word translated here as gathered is sunago, and it means to collect or convene. The council, which they're talking about here, is the Jewish Sanhedrin. The Jewish law court, which had jurisdiction over civil and religious matters with Roman approval. The Sanhedrin was made up of the chief priests, who were mostly Sadducees, and the Pharisees, who were mostly scribes. The chief priests dominated the Sanhedrin, but the Pharisees were a powerful minority. And the third smaller group in the Sanhedrin was the elders. They were aristocrats with mixed theological views. So this council gets together, this law court, this Jewish law court, they get together and they ask this question. What are we to do? I mean, they're asking, what do we do about this Rabbi Yeshua? He just raised a man from the dead. So what's the logical answer to this question? What do you do? You believe him. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the guy's claiming to be the Messiah. He's raising people from the dead. Healing blind people. He's doing all this. Yeah, this makes sense. But they're just like, they're confused. We don't know what to do. We've got to do something. For this man performs many signs. <laughs> do you see what they're saying here? This is the testimony of the Sanhedrin. The people who hated Yeshua and wanted Him dead. This is their testimony. This wasn't the first miracle that these enemies of Yeshua had seen. They'd seen the man who had been paralyzed for 38 years walking. They knew the man that had been born blind from birth and sat at the temple gate and begged they saw Him seeing. Now they see this. He raises the dead. They acknowledge that He is performing many signs. Now the Greek word used for sign here is semeon. And it means a mark, an indication, or a token. It has the idea an event that is an indication or confirmation of intervention by transcendent powers or miracle. It's used of miraculous acts as tokens of divine authority and power. So these works performed by Yeshua are not just supernatural miracles. They are signs that unveil the glory and the power of God working through Yeshua the Messiah. Now they've seen Him raise the dead and they still reject Him. They don't want anything to do with it. The words that they speak are incredible. It's almost beyond belief. This man's doing a lot of miracles, a lot of signs. What are we going to do? They express no doubt about the power of the Lord or the legitimacy of the signs He's performed. They admit it's all true, but in spite of the evidence, they don't believe. And the reason they don't believe is because they are not His sheep. Verse 48, If we let it go on like this, everyone will believe in Him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. All right? So, this is what they think. They, everyone's going to believe in Him. Now, they don't mean this literally because they're not about to believe. They're using hyperbole here. We've got to stop this guy because just people or everyone's believing in Him. We've got to do something. And they say, this is what's going to happen. The Romans are going to come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, the word, by the word place here, what they mean is their temple. They're going to come and they're going to take away our temple and they're going to take away our nation. After the desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 B.C., the Jews were almost paranoid about losing the temple, so they were doing everything they could to make sure they are allowed to go on the way they were. See, the Jewish leaders had come to an understanding with the occupying Roman forces that allowed them to control considerable money-making schemes and enjoy a position of power and leadership within their own community. So the Romans had given the Jewish leadership the permission to go on, you guys self-govern, 
you take care of things, you go ahead and rip the people off because they had all kinds of money-making schemes, you know, the temple and the sacrifices. They were ripping the people off like crazy. You guys go ahead, we'll let you get rich over this. Just keep things under control. See, they, the Romans didn't want any problems. They didn't want people stirring up and having, you know, riots and all this stuff. So as long as they didn't aggravate the Romans, as long as they kept the status quo, the Romans said, all right, you can go on that way. But here's the problem. <clears throat> At this time, nationalistic expectations were rising. And there was a fear that popular messianic expectation would be fired to a fever pitch. And with or without Yeshua's sanction, they're going to set off uh, riots that are going to bring down the full power of Rome. Remember, the people are peaked at this time. They're, they're waiting for Messiah. They think He should show up at any time. And then, so here comes this guy and he's raising the dead. The people are jacked up about this, you know? You know, I think that as Lazarus writes this, he expects his audience to catch the irony here. See, it's not the nation's acceptance of Yeshua, their Messiah, which brings down the nation. It's their rejection of Yeshua as the Messiah. A generation after Yeshua's execution, Rome will march on this nation, capture Jerusalem, destroy the temple, kill countless Jews, all because they rejected their Messiah, not because they accepted Him. So they got it kind of backwards. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Now Caiaphas, this is a reference to Joseph Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time. He was at the high priest at the time from beginning from John the Baptizer's ministry during the trial of Yeshua. And he was the son-in-law of Annas, who served as high priest from 6 AD to 15 AD. And he still had a great deal of influence at this time. It says, Caiaphas, who was high priest? Presiding over the Sanhedrin was Caiaphas. Joseph Caiaphas was appointed high priest by the Roman governor, Valerius Gradius, in 18 AD. He was deposed by Roman governor Vertilius in 36 AD, the same year Governor Pilate was recalled to Rome. Now, Caiaphas may have been the first to suggest that Yeshua would have to be killed to prevent a revolt. The writings of the Jewish historian Josephus collaborates this idea, the biblical account that Caiaphas tenature is high priest at that time. He's high priest during this time. Now some biblical scholars, uh, Boltman for one, many others, have accused the author here, Lazarus, of not understanding Jewish traditions. They say that the reference to Caiaphas being high priest that year betrays a lack of knowledge about Palestinian customs, since according to the Mosaic Law, priests of Yahweh held a position for how long? How long was a priest appointed to, according to Numbers 35-25? Life. It's a lifetime job. You get tenure, okay? You get in there, you stay, all right, until you die, all right? But the Romans controlled appointment of high priests at this time, and they saw a lifetime appointment as too much power and influence. So they said, that's not going to work. So according to Scripture, the high priest was an office for life. But as we said, Rome changed all that. And between Herod the Great and 70 AD, when Jerusalem was destroyed, which is about 100 years, there were 28 high priests. During this time, the high priest is a political position. People are buying and selling this position. This is how messed up Jerusalem and the whole religious thing is at that time. You even have references in the New Testament to Annas and Caiaphas <coughs> both being high priests at the same time. Now, if Lazarus was suggesting a one-year term, that would certainly be an error because Caiaphas was high priest for 18 years. But what's interesting is the connection between the triple phrase High priest that year. We find that three times in this Gospel. There's a connection between that phrase and Yeshua's sacrificial death. Meaning He was high priest the year, that year, the year that Christ was crucified. These three times in this Gospel, three times we see the phrase. And it's always connected with the sacrifice of Christ. So when he's saying he's high priest that year, not just the year, the year that Christ died. Let's look at these three. First, uh, 11, 49, and 50. He says he was high priest that year. You know, 
it, he said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people. So the year he's high priest, he connects that with Christ dying for the people. Verse 51, He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for the nation. And again in 18, 13, and 14, For they led him to Annas, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So every time it's mentioned that Caiaphas was high priest that year, it's also mentioned that Christ's death was that year, his sacrificial death. So what's the significance of this link between these repeated phrases? Well, the high priest Caiaphas is linked to Yeshua's sacrificial death. In the Old Covenant system, it's the high priest who makes the yearly sacrifice for the sins of the people during the Feast of the Day of Atonement. In the early fall of that year, 30 A.D., Caiaphas chose the lamb and sacrificed it on the Day of Atonement for the sins of the people. In that same year, in March, he's going to choose the true lamb and will be instrumental in offering his sacrifice for the sins of the world. And this is why Lazarus used that phrase three times. Yeshua's sacrificial death will be the full and complete sacrifice which all animal sacrifices pointed to and prefigured. So Caiaphas says to the council, you know nothing at all. Now this is the ancient equivalent of, you're a bunch of idiots. Okay? That's what he's saying. And what's interesting is that fits what Josephus says about the Sadducees. Remember, Caiaphas is a Sadducee. Josephus says the, the Sadducees were barbarous and wild even toward their own party. But in taking Josephus into account, we have to remember that he was a Pharisee. Okay? So Pharisees and Sadducees didn't get along all that good, so what he says about uh, Sadducees you might take with a, a grain of salt, so to speak. Verse 50 says, You don't understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. It's better for you. Now, he's not talking about what's good for the Jewish nation. He's not talking about what's good for the people. The Greek here makes it plain. He's talking about self-interest. It's good for us. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. It's good for us. It's going to benefit us that one man should die for the people. Now, that phrase, for the people there, is used often in sacrificial terms. It's sacrificial language. It would have reminded them of the sacrifice offered in the temple in Jerusalem. The basis for these sacrifices was substitution. One died in place of another. An animal was sacrificed to take the guilt of another. A scapegoat was sacrificed. Another was freed as a picture of someone dying in the place and for the sake of another. And that's exactly the imagery that Caiaphas used. Now he certainly didn't mean this in a Christian sense. He was unconsciously echoing a saying of Yeshua himself. In Mark 10.45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Christ came to be a ransom. Now Caiaphas is thinking at the purely political level here. He had no clue that Yeshua was going to die, not to take the place the political nation Israel, but on behalf of the true people of God. He didn't understand that. He is thinking of the nation, his political position. And Lazarus expects his readers to think in terms of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That one man should die for the people. So the Christians get it. Oh, I understand what he's talking about. He's talking about Yeshua dying for the sins of the world. But that's not what he's thinking about. Not that the whole nation should perish. And it's ironic that what Caiaphas was trying to prevent did occur. In AD 66, the Jews revolted against Rome. The nation was destroyed. A million people died. The rest were sold into slavery. The temple was destroyed in AD 70, just as Yeshua prophesied it would be in Matthew 24, 1 and 2. And it was never rebuilt, and they never sacrificed since. So the nation perished. Not because of Yeshua's activity, but because of Yahweh's judgment for their rejection of the Messiah. Now let me ask you something here. How do we know... I mean, basically, these last couple of verses are telling us what's going on in the meeting in the Sanhedrin. How do we know what went on in the meeting? No, he wasn't in the meeting of the Sanhedrin. 
How do we know what's going on in the Sanhedrin? You know of anybody in the Sanhedrin that might have given us some information? Nicodemus? Joseph of Arimathea, maybe? These guys are part of the Sanhedrin, and you know, I think maybe Nicodemus came out and said, uh, Lord, you need to get out of here if they want to kill you. Here's what they're talking about. Anyway, we got insight into the meeting. You see, he did not say this, the, the idea that his, he didn't say that he's going to die for the people. He didn't say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for the nation. So Lazarus interpreted Caiaphas' words for his readers. He viewed Caiaphas' statement as a prophecy. Now, was Caiaphas a believer? Was he a Christian? No. Was he used of God? Yes. Anybody have a problem with God using an unbeliever? No. Cyrus, you ever heard of Cyrus? God used Cyrus, called him the rod of my anger. He's speaking through this man, this unbeliever. See, in the mind of Caiaphas, the substitution was this. We kill Yeshua, so the Romans don't kill us. Because we're, we're afraid. They're going to riot and the Romans are going to kill us. All right, But in the mind of God, the substitution is this. I will kill my son, so I don't have to kill you. God substitutes Yeshua for His chosen ones. Now, if saying that God was thinking, I'm going to kill my son, seems too harsh for you, look at Isaiah 53. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. It was God the Father who put the Son to death for us. Verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And Yahweh has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. All our iniquity was put on Christ. People, this is the heart of the Christian faith. God substituted Yeshua for us. So let me ask you this. How much of our debt did Yeshua pay? All of it? I don't think most people believe that. They believe what He did was helpful. But that you got to add your part to it, right? No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Christ paid it, and He paid it in full. Romans 5.8 But God shows His love for us. Now, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why He died. For us. God invaded human history in the form of the man Christ, Yeshua. Yeshua lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death at Calvary. On that cross, He took my sin upon Himself and received the judgment of God that I deserved. And because He was an infinite, innocent sufferer, He satisfied fully and completely the righteous demands of a holy God, and God was propitiated. Propitiation is the removal of wrath by the offering of a sacrifice. It's the turning of God's wrath away from the sinner by a sacrifice made to satisfy God. Christ satisfied the righteous demands of God. 1 Peter 2.24 He Himself bore our sins. Christ bore our sins in His body on a tree. That we might die to sin and live to right to righteousness. By His wounds we have been healed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. So Christ became sin, watch, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God Him. He took our sin and gave us His righteousness. So, how righteous do you have to be to get to heaven? 100%. You have to have Christ's righteousness. That's the only way to get in heaven. It's His righteousness that gets us in, not ours. He bore our sin. He gave us His righteousness. He did it all. Paid the price in full. So he says that one man should die for the people and he did not say this of his own accord. He prophesied. God's using this man. From a human perspective, the words of Caiaphas look like a hostile human plan to bring Messiah to his death. 
But from the divine perspective, Lazarus shows us that the very words executed out of this man's mouth were from God. And God had a totally different plan than Caiaphas. Now here's something that's kind of amusing, I think, in this text. The Sadducees, you know why they were sad, right? Because they didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in predestination. They didn't believe that God controlled the affairs of man. So here is the chief representative of a group of people that don't believe that God controls the actions of men who says, it's better for you that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation perish. And all the time, God is controlling His tongue to speak the exact words He utters. He doesn't believe in predestination, but God is using Him anyway to do exactly what He wants to do. And He's prophesying. Now, I like how Young's words this in verse uh, 51. He says, Yeshua was about to die for the nation. And he says about to because the word mellow is there. And when mellow is used, it's something soon to happen. I think you preterists are aware of the word mellow. But it's used in other places. You know, here he's about to die. It's within a week or so he's going to die. About to. Verse 52. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. The verb gathered here, again, is sunaho. And it's the same Greek word that was used in 47 for the gathering together of the priests and the Pharisees. So, what's the importance of the contrast here between the two gatherings? Well, the priests and the Pharisees gathered to kill Yeshua, and God is gathering His children that He may give them life. Now, in a purely Jewish context, the children of God who are scattered abroad would be understood to refer to the Jews of the Diaspora, who would be gathered into the kingdom of God. But as Christians, I think we're quick to draw the typological connections here. The real children of God are those who receive the incarnate Word of God and trust in His name. Those are the children of God. All of this anticipates the Gentile mission that Paul so clearly lays out in Ephesians chapter 2. So it's not going to be just the Jewish nation. He's going to reach out to all people, not for the nation only but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. This text talks about gathering into one the children of God. Now let me ask you something. Why are they called children of God before they're gathered? I mean, if He hasn't even brought them in, they're not really His children yet, right? Well, the answer, again, is found in the predestinarian emphasis on this Gospel. Yeshua already has sheep in other pens who He must bring, 10.16. Certain people have already been given to the Son by the Father, John 6.37. Even if they have not yet become believers, in other words, God has a people chosen to Himself all over the world, Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5. He's going to gather the children who He's already decided to bring in. They're not believers yet, but they're going to be because He's going to draw them. So from that day on, they made plans to put Him to death. You've got to catch the irony of this verse. The Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of Israel, decide to kill the man who gives life. They are obviously liberals because they have no thought to logic. Okay? He claims to be the resurrection of life and he raises a dead man. And so their decision? Let's kill him. What? What? And here, basically, the Sanhedrin decides to commit murder. We're going to kill this man because we don't want to lose our, posi our political position. You know what's funny? When Peter was preaching in Jerusalem in the temple courtyard after the day of Pentecost, he indicts the Jews with this accusation. He says, you killed the author of life. That's what the Sanhedrin did. They killed the author of life. You bring life to people, we're going to put you to death. Now, in light of this information, the later trials of Yeshua before the high priest and the Sanhedrin 
were simply formalities designed to give the appearance of justice. Because, see, they decided right here, from that day on, we're putting you, we don't need a trial, we don't need any more evidence, we're going to put you to death. That's their decision. They would already tried and sentenced him. And maybe that's why Lazarus didn't record Yeshua's trial before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin as the synoptic writers did. Because he saw this meeting of the Sanhedrin as the real trial of Yeshua. They made a decision, we're going to kill him. And I think Lazarus must have had John 3.18 in mind as he wrote this section. 3.18 says this, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, the Sanhedrin thought they were judging and condemning Yeshua. In fact, they were pronouncing judgment on themselves and on the nation. They're judging themselves. They're bringing damnation on that nation from God because of the rejection of the Messiah, and the evidence was so clear that He was the Messiah. 1154 says, Yeshua therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there He stayed with the disciples. Now, Yeshua may have learned of the Sanhedrin's decision from a sympathetic member of the Sanhedrin, such as Nicodemus. So He withdraws to a private place and no longer ministers publicly. Now, by leaving the area, Yeshua avoided premature arrest. See, He had to die on the Passover in fulfillment of prophetic symbolism. The real, He's the real Passover Lamb. And He can only die on the Passover, so He leaves. I don't want them you know, trying to grab me beforehand. And He went to the region near the wilderness. Now, there's only two wildernesses mentioned in the Gospels. The wilderness of Judea, southeast of Jerusalem, and the wilderness north of Perea where John baptized. I think the site of Perea here makes more sense. He just went back to where he was ministering before he was called to come heal Lazarus. So he went back to that secluded area just to be away from them because he knew what the plot was to, kill his, to take his life. Now, verse 55 says, now the, Pharise- now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover, to purify themselves. Now, Lazarus has connected all of Yeshua's trip to Jerusalem with major Jewish religious festivals. The Passover, Tabernacles, the Feast of Dedication. They're all contexts in which Yeshua ministered in Jerusalem. But in John 11:55 through 12:1, we see an extraordinary emphasis on the Passover. Three times within these four verses, he mentions the Passover. And it seems that he's trying to alert us that the most important visit of Yeshua to Jerusalem was about to take place. That's because He dies on this visit. This is the Passover that's a week away that He's going to be put to death. So He's emphasizing that. Now the Passover originated in Israel's experience in Egypt the night before Exodus. The Passover was the prelude to freedom. They're being set free from bondage. And so the Passover here is a prelude to the freedom that God has appointed for His people. See, the Mosaic Law required that the Jews who had become virtually unclean had to purify themselves for one week before participating in this feast, according to Numbers chapter 9. So many of the people would go to Jerusalem at least a week beforehand so they could go through purification so they could make sure we can take the Passover. There's a lot of people pouring in. Now, Brown estimates that between 85,000 and 125,000 pilgrims were added to the normal Jerusalem population of about 25,000. So the news of that day for all these pilgrims was Lazarus was raised from the dead. They're all pouring in there. And listen, they know of Yeshua. They've heard about Him. Why are they looking for Him? It says they're looking for Yeshua and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? He will not come to the feast at all? Why were they looking for Him? Because every festival, every feast so far, He'd been the main attraction there. He was there preaching, teaching in these festivals. He's the focal point. And the word that Lazarus' resurrection would have just spread like wildfire. So now they really want to see this. Remember, Messianic fever is high. Who is this guy that's doing these things? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders. That if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so they might arrest him. So there's a warrant out. 
for Yeshua's arrest. And remember, the people are scared to death of these leaders. They could de-synagogue them, which would be, you know, you lose your job, you lose your family, you lose your friends, you lose every social contact. They, they feared these men. And so they put it out, you know, we want to know where he is. And I think the reader can hardly miss the point that Israel's leaders had deliberately rejected their Messiah. All the indications of Scripture were clear, and they missed it because they weren't a sheep. Now, the authorities, they're certain that Yeshua's going to show up at this festival. That's why they tell these people this. And the reason I think they're sure is because this is a pilgrim feast. Every Jewish male had to attend. So Yeshua previously attended these holy days in obligation to that, and so they figure, yeah, He's going to show up. That we threatened his life before he still came, so they're telling the people, we want you to be aware, look for this man. He's going to be here. So this whole chapter is about a resurrection and its ramifications. Now, what are the ramifications of this resurrection? Well, number one, it demonstrates that Yeshua is the giver of life. Chapter 10, the emphasis was on life, and in chapter 11, he raises a dead man. And remember the difference between Lazarus and everybody else raised from the dead was he's dead four days. Decomposition had set in. He put this guy all back together and brought him out. Secondly, it serves to strengthen the faith of those who believe in Yeshua. His disciples, Martha and Mary, these people had trusted Christ and now they see this and it's just like they're strengthening their faith. Yes, they're excited about this. Number three, it brings... To faith, Yeshua is Messiah. Many to faith. I mean, people are coming to Him because they saw this happen. And now Lazarus is walking around telling his story. Can you even imagine what he had to say? So it brings many to faith. Fourthly, to those who are not His sheep, it has no effect. Nothing. doesn't do a thing for people who are not His. And fifthly, it brings about a united Sanhedrin intent on bringing about the death of Yeshua. This resurrection was the final straw, so to speak, that made the Sanhedrin say, that's it, we're going after him, we're going to kill him, we're done. And in about a week, they're going to take him and put him to death. So these are all ramifications of this resurrection. So the same event, the resurrection of Lazarus, Brings many to faith, but on others it has no effect at all. And the reason for the difference is not in man. The reason for the difference is the sovereign call of God. To those He calls, they come alive, they come out of the grave, they are excited. To those He does not call, they remain dead in their trespasses and sins. You know, if you can even just imagine seeing something like this you know, how it would affect you if you knew somebody was dead and they had begun, decomposition had begun to set in and someone comes along and, you know, claiming to be God at a time when the people are looking for Messiah and He raised the dead. It's hard to imagine this not affecting people. But the natural man, Paul says in Corinthians, does not understand the things of God. Their foolishness to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for this incredible story of Lazarus and you as the giver of life. Father, help us to understand that this physical resurrection is an illustration of what you do, of what you have done in our lives, and what you do for everyone whom you have called. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I know left to ourselves we would never have chosen you, we would never have been interested. Thank you that you called us brought us into your family. You made us your children. Amen. Amen.